Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you don't know me, my name is Kimberly Randall. I work at the Lister Health Center for Health Policy here in the School of Public Health. For 2023, our center is focused on the ways, uh, the themes of public health advocacy and civic engagement, detailing the ways that people from all backgrounds and experiences can get involved in policy. Today's event is the first of many that we're hosting this fall, and I hope that you've already made plans to attend our next event on, on October 10th, See the Stories, The Human Side of Medicaid Expansion, moderated by our very own Dr. David Becker. Now, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our speaker. After spending many years at Emory University School of Law, where he was the founding director for the Center of the Study of Law and Religion, and the interim dean of the law school, Frank Alexander has recently focused on community development and affordable housing. He's the co-founder and senior advisor for the Center for Community Progress, a national nonprofit entity that provides technical assistance to local and state governments in the conversion of vacant and abandoned properties into productive uses. He's also the founder and executive director of Vulnerable Communities Initiative, a nonprofit focusing on serving communities in the intersection of economic, social, and racial vulnerability and climate change vulnerability. He has served as the principal draftsman for legislation in 17 different states and has testified twice before congressional committees on strategies to address the mortgage foreclosure crisis in 2008 and 2009. Frank received his Juris Doctorate from Harvard Law School, a Master's in Theological Studies from Harvard Divinity School, and his Bachelor's from the University of North Carolina. But most importantly, Frank made it very clear that he dedicates so much of his success to Frank Cade, Fran Cade, who we also warm Give a warm welcome with today who is in the audience. Thank you, Kimberly, for those uh, unnecessary remarks. I am so honored to be here uh, to learn from each of you, to get to know each of you. I am filled with uh, Kierkegaardian fear and trembling um, because public health is not my field. Um, my childhood and professional ambition has been to be able to go and get a master's in public health and to be able to be a part of the, uh, help me with the terminology, EIS. Um, that's what I wanted to do, but my pilgrimage got waylaid into these other topics. Uh, but uh, Dr. Judd, D Dr. Hannon, thank you very much for uh, inviting me and allowing me to be with you today. What I want to share with you are, though I have entitled it, The Essential Elements in Systemic Reform. As Kimberly said, for the past three, four decades, I have spent a lot of my time trying to figure out legal issues that seem to be caused part of the problem rather than part of the solution. And this led me down rabbit holes into dealing with the simple question that a mentor of mine posed me one day back in 92. Uh, Frank, why can't we get this house sitting only half a mile from the Atlanta Capitol, the Georgia State Capitol, that was overgrown with kudzu? Why can't we get this house and use it for Habitat for Humanity. And I said, I don't know, but I'll try to figure it out. And that rabbit hole led me down property tax issues and the fact that in Georgia, property that was delinquent in the taxes, if it didn't sell at the tax sale, it'd be taken again the next year to a tax sale. And then the next year, and the next year, because nobody would buy it, nobody was protesting the taxes, the taxes were going up, the property value was going down. And so, all right, there's something broken in that system. That then led me down the path of working with communities across the country to try and tinker with the systems on what we call in my nonprofits, bad, vacant, abandoned, deteriorated property. Which when I walk in neighborhoods and I see a lot of bad, vacant, abandoned, deteriorated properties, I get excited. I mean, these are the best community assets. If we can figure out how to convert, get control of them and put them back into new uses 
or a moniker of community progress is turning vacant spaces into vibrant places. So that's what's been occupying most of my attention for the last couple of decades. I'm honored to be here to speak with you and share with you, but I'm most excited about the Q&A. I want to find out what's troubling your heart the troubling your mind. So I'm going to keep my remarks as short as possible here. <laughs> but as a law professor, I can go on for hours and not be aware of it. But I'm watching the clock. <laughs> I've subtitled this, The Essential Elements in Achieving or Seeking Systemic Reform. But a better title that occurred to me last night would have been not The Essential Elements, but simply Lessons I Have Learned in trying to achieve systemic reform. There are four parts. Research and analysis, listening, learning, and serving. The first part, for the next five or six minutes, is really addressed to those of you who are students, either undergraduate or graduate students, and I don't care what field you're in. Um, but Dr. Hannon said I wouldn't have a lot of law students in, in the class right now. <laughs> The goal is the mastery of a subject matter. And again, this is for the upper level undergraduates, the masters and the doctoral level students. What I as a professor challenge you to do is to become the foremost master of that precise topic in the country. Now that necessarily means you've got to learn how to narrow your focus so that you can learn everything there is to know about that particular detail. You need to be able to understand it historically, culturally, how it has evolved. You need to be able to read all of the literature on that topic, engage in conversation with the scholars of that particular topic. Once you have done that, The actual topic I suggest to you is not what I am after or you're necessarily after. It's the development of analytic skills so that you can begin to unwind the Gordian knot. You can begin to see the needle in the haystack, but always with reference to everything else around it. If you are so fortunate to find a topic that you want to spend the rest of your life uh, uh, focusing on, more power to you, bless you. I have to confess, property taxes is not that way for me. <laughs> that does not feed my soul. But I got led down that path of unwinding the systems there. The key thing to keep in mind is the analytic tools so that those are transportable to the second topic or to another discipline. To paraphrase the former justice, Oliver Wendell Holmes, he said, the goal is to be able to see the universal in the particular, but not to let the particular become your universe. Mm -hmm. All right, identifying systemic breaks, some suggestions. Again, this is primarily for those of you who are early in your professional career. Know the systems that are relevant to the break you were puzzled by. In my field, my first question is, what are the relevant legal systems? And the obvious three are the federal, the state, and the local. I need to know how much of those, each of those systems bears on the precise topic. Now we spend, all of us spend a lot of time complaining or criticizing the federal government, the federal constitution or statutes. Let me suggest to you that most of our lives are not governed by the federal constitution. Yes, there are certainly key things that are important. But what you do from the very first time you wake up in the morning has nothing to do with federal law, or almost nothing to do. If your alarm clock is not going off because of a power failure, it is usually not the federal government's responsibility. <laughs> Most of what we do in our day-to-day -day lives 
is determined to the extent it's, there's laws involved at all by the state and local fund. So I said, after I'd been teaching for 30 years and finally came to this conclusion, I wanted to start teaching state and local government law. And I loved it because I also discovered that's where the people are. People's lives are at the state and local level, not so much arguing before the Supreme Court or a Circuit Court of Appeals. Target the repair as narrowly as possible. Again, these are things I've learned the hard way. When I think I have identified the break in the system, don't try to rewrite the entire system. Figure out what piece is broken. I've discovered that some of the most effective work I have done over the decades has simply been to change one line in one statute, not to rewrite the entire law, but by changing one line in one uh, statutory section in the Georgia Code or pick your state. Then I go in and say, if I tweak that sentence, sometimes in a dramatic fashion, but a one-line change in a statute usually doesn't attract as much attention, so I'm able to get it through the legislative process more quickly. So target your repair, again, if I'm going to speak in a different vernacular, when there is a broken pipe, always see if you can repair that broken pipe. But given what I said earlier, You've got to undertake your repairs with the knowledge that the fact that you might repair the pipe under the street or in your house, only to have an, another portion break tomorrow. But you've got to always look at your micro repairs as narrowly as possible, but understanding the broader context. Using the right tools. Now, I'll defer to my, my nephew, who's here, to teach me, and he has been one of my professors in teaching me about tools. My tendency as an academic is to grab a tool when I'm trying to fix something. But I, make sure you grab the right tool. For those of you, particularly, and this one I put for Dr. Randall. Uh, here. Be very careful about saying, we're you need indoor plumbing. We're going to walk away from straight pipes. We're going to put in plumbing in your house and have it go into a septic field. Well, as y'all know better than I, if a septic field doesn't percolate, it ain't going to work. So be very self-conscious about the solution you think you have for it. Don't use a hammer when a socket wrench is what you need. You're not going to make much progress banging on a, a nut and bolt with a hammer to take something apart and put it back together again. And that is a mistake I've made many times in thinking that if I take something that I have created across the country over the past decades called a land bank, and I'm working with Dr. Hammond's, the Birmingham Land Bank Authority right now. But that's just one tool in a, in a policy and legal system. A land bank isn't going to solve everything, but I can design a particular tool that can make a difference for systemic reform. But always be asking yourself whether there are other tools in the toolbox for systemic reform. Tweaking it here or here, or adding this kind of statute or that kind of statute. <clears throat> this is one of my pet examples here. For all kinds of interesting historic reasons, we've dealt with housing and building code violations, and we say we're gonna issue criminal citations. When the, the owner of the property hasn't repaired it, and it's deteriorating, and the city is trying to clean it up, we're gonna file criminal charges, usually misdemeanors, against the owner. It doesn't do any good. There are too many lawyers, 
and I say that as a law professor, who know how to put a piece of property into a sing, what we call a single asset, LLC, a corporation that only owns a property, and you can't put a single asset corporation in jail. Using criminal sanction to try and achieve the social goal of housing and building code compliance is a waste of time. And it is incredibly expensive because if you're, as we do in Atlanta, you cite the owners of low income properties and it's air property, you know, owned by multiple members of generations. And you're citing that with misdemeanors. So then we have a public defender appointed at public cost to represent them and you put them in jail, they don't have the money to fix it in the first place. So using criminal citations makes no sense either for the high-end properties or the low-end properties. So we need to be, make sure that we're using the best tool. Another one, because I spend, a, my passion is low-income housing, affordable housing, things like that. And as I work with communities to develop new low-income housing, not, and I'm not doing it here in Birmingham, but on the coast of Georgia, the Atlantic Coast, obviously, of Georgia. The proposals are new affordable housing built on concrete pads. Yes, we're putting it in marshland because it's the cheapest. It makes no sense to do it that way. We've got a lot of folks who are together on trying to meet this need, but we've got to realize we're using the wrong tool here in the wrong place to meet affordable housing goals. Now on to the most important things. Again, it's, I say this because I made the mistake in not doing this and I had to learn the hard way. I gotta listen. I have to listen to who is most effective. I gotta be willing to learn from that. And I don't do this after I've created a solution and gone in to tell the folks a solution. <laughs> I've gotta start here. Or actually, I start hopefully with mastery of the subject matter of what I think the subject matter is. But then I have to listen to them, those who are most effective. I've gotta ask them, what are their concerns and priorities? I need them to teach me as a white boy of privilege with all kinds of education stuff, I tend to think I have the answers because I can undo the Gordian knot at times. But that's absolutely wrong. I've got to listen to the folks who are most affected. And then I ask the question, how can I serve you? This, I've discovered the hard way, if I have not <coughs> listened and learned and built a trusting relationship, it makes no difference how much I may have studied or how good my solution may be. If they're not willing to trust me, then it's a non-starter. And again, the they is those who are most affected here. This morning I had a call from a close colleague about a place called Sapelo Island, McIntosh County, Georgia, the, the original place of the Gullah Geechee, and a tiny little community called Hog Hammock. Um, it's been in the news the last two weeks, if you saw it, any of it. Well, the McIntosh County Commission just approved rezoning of Hog Hammock in a manner that a lot allows for McMansions. And this is a very low income, you know, five generational Gullah Geechee community. And it, it, they were never consulted um, about this rezoning. We don't know where it came from, but it passed the city council. And my colleague, Jazz Watts, uh, who is Gullah Geechee, lives in Hog Hammock, called me this morning and said, Frank, we, that, the people that live here, are tired of people coming in and telling us what our problems are and what the solutions are. We've been hearing this for you know 200 years now. And he says the problem is that 
people come in, perhaps well-intentioned, with solutions, but their solutions usually consist of bringing, metaphorically, figuratively, a load of wood and a can of gas, and they burn down our community. Learning from the people. Picking up on what I said earlier about my expectations for my students, graduate and undergraduate, is that I expect you to become a master and develop incredibly tight analytic skills. But don't fool yourself into thinking that knowledge alone is sufficient. In the words of Adlai Stevenson 50, 70 years ago, knowledge alone is not enough. It must be leavened with magnanimity before it becomes wisdom. Learn the priorities of the people you are working with. I spent some time working and still working with a small community on the Georgia coast. And yes, I've done the GIS analysis of sea level rise and water tables and say to this church community, um, are you planning on retreating? And they said, no. I said, well, how is the flooding, daylight flooding, affecting your community? She says, well, our church is built up on pillars, so we don't have a problem in our sanctuary. And I turned and said, well, what about there, pointing to the graveyard in this tiny little church? And she says, yes, they flood. And I said, why are you staying here in the face of the rising sea levels? And she said, because those are our people, and this is our place. So important for me to hear that. And I said, okay, can, how can we protect these graves? And I'm not referring to, uh, what's the name of the church? Uh, little Sister, downtown Charleston, St. Michael's? St. Philip's. St. Philip's, that has all the pinky graves in it. St. Philip's. You know, they're going to already be underwater in daylight flooding. I'm dealing with a poor community, uh, African-American community in um, McIntosh County. And you know, the power of place, particularly ancestral place, and saying, these are my ancestors. I'm not leaving. That was such an important lesson for me to learn. Be conscious of your own baggage particularly for those of us who happen to have the luxury of attending strong academic educations and thinking that then I have the answers. Well, for me, I have to always be conscious of the fact that I don't know what these people are experiencing. My favorite times are when I'm working in a weak, what we euphemistically call weak market neighborhoods in Detroit or in Flint and hanging out with the residents who live there. Because they need to, A, help me become very conscious of my own baggage and to teach me what their priorities are. Not something for a law professor, uh, to, that is easy for a law professor to say. <clears throat> but I am sharing it with you, because if I'm not willing to understand my own narrow blindness, short-sightedness, my own baggage, then I'm not gonna hear the other person. I've gotta be willing to say whatever neighborhood I'm working in, on whatever issue, I'm a newcomer. I need to hear from you. I need you to teach me and acknowledge in that process <clears throat> my own baggage. This is the most important point of all I'm gonna say. There are always <coughs> ripples. Throw a rock in a pond. When you do that, the ripples go to every aspect of the shoreline. Our lives are all creating ripples. Everything we do creates ripples. As a property lawyer, I usually deal with the concept that if you own a piece of property, you own it from the center of the earth to the top of the heavens. It's yours, you can do what you want with it. You have that property right. 
but think about it differently. Everything you do with your property impacts the other property nearby. It takes my students a while for me to under to get for them to explain to me why Dr. Hannon doesn't like it if I dump my nuclear waste on my property. He's some he's he's got a problem with that. So every piece of property is interrelated. Particularly those of you who are into environmental science, you understand the interrelationship. As humans, we tend to ignore that. But I'll state it differently. In a world of Robinson Crusoe, there is no such thing as a property right. Because there are no other people. <laughs> property is that which defines relationships between people with respect to things. Uh, then I will summarize here, <laughs> uh, Kimberly. You can seek to do things to people or to communities. And that's the approach a lot of us take instinctively. I got solutions, or I got a way to make your life better, so I'm going to do it to you. That tends, in the case of the most vulnerable, to means we're going to take care of your housing because we're going to bulldoze and put it in an interstate. You can seek to do things for people and for communities. Yeah, you can argue this is a little bit more benevolent nepotism, but I'm trying to I, I'm trying to do what I think is best for you. And the only time I ever get away with that is with when we had three adolescent sons at home. <laughs> you do it because I said, and it's because I think it's good for you. It didn't last very long. Uh, or you can seek to do things with people and with communities. And so what I'm saying is these are all overlapping and all are right at some points. But be aware of the differences. For me, the most important element in systemic change is to get to this. And realize we're all in this together. And we've got to figure out a way to fix what's broken in that system. Some final bits of advice. Always engage in coalition building. Always do coalition building. Know thine adversaries. Now, I usually think I know who's going to be opposed to my solutions. And usually I'm wrong. I think they're adversaries. But once I've sat down with them, I realize it's because they didn't understand what I was proposing, or they had a different problem they wanted solved, and I wasn't solving their problem. In some states, the people that opposed the legislation initially, within a year or two, but if we got it passed, they became the best supporters of the legislation. Sometimes my adversaries, as I do legislative initiatives, are actually my closest friends because we haven't spent enough time building a coalition and figuring out which way we go. And then there are always some who are just going to have a different value set and not be comfortable at all with my view of law or systems. Assess the unintended consequences. Everything, because of the ripple effect, has unintended consequences. Assess them as well as you can before you go down that path. And then know that it may require whatever system change you did is going to require further revision as you become more aware of system changes. Kimberly said I've done legislation in a bunch of states, yes. But about every once every few years I have to go back into that state because I realized we didn't see this coming. When I, First was working in Flint, Michigan, helping them create strategies for vacant and abandoned properties. I never anticipated the lead in the homes. We had acquired a lot of properties, put people into those homes, and then every one of them had lead in the water. Here are my pillars every time I'm drafting something. Is it efficient? Does it 
is it designed to achieve the result with the lowest possible cost? Don't do things multiple times thinking you're going to get a different solution. <laughs> Don't do it six times. Do it once. It's efficiency. Effectiveness, make sure you're getting the result, the optimum result you want. And then equitable, make sure that any system change is taking into consideration the wide differences in resources that we will have. That your systemic change fully takes into consideration the people who are most vulnerable, socioeconomically, racially. Dream the impossible. I'm very much uh, the Don Quixote in this. I always want to have a dream. But then I quickly realize that I can have the dream, but I got a plan for next year or two years and take this systemic change incrementally over time. And then always celebrating today. All right, the final thing I want to leave you with is this. In the opportunity for service lies the possibility of freedom. I'll stop there. Dr. Hannon, Kimberly.